Welcome back. You're listening to The Voice of Russia with me, Paulina Boyko. From Thursday, the Russian government is bringing in new laws restricting access to late-term abortions. Until now, women in prison, widows, those with husbands with severe disabilities, rape victims and women stripped of parental rights all qualified for state-funded abortions after 12 weeks. But that's set to change. Now only women who have been raped will qualify. Under the new rules, there'll also be a mandatory one-week waiting period after a woman consults a doctor before she can actually have a termination. The government says the move is necessary to turn around Russia's demographic crisis that, according to the UN, threatens to knock a fifth off the country's population by 2050. But critics are sceptical about the government's motivations, saying it's more more about promoting family values and a socially conservative agenda supported by the Russian Orthodox Church. Demographic experts have also warned the move could actually worsen Russia's rapid depopulation. On the line from Moscow, I'm joined by Lubov Yurafeyeva. She's the general director of the Russian non-governmental organization, Russian Association for Population and Development. In the studio, I have with me Dr. Charlie Walker, a sociology lecturer at the University of Southampton. I'm also joined by Anne Scanlon, who's a London region education officer for Life Charity. And finally, I'm also joined by Kate Smurthwaite, media spokesperson for Abortion Rights UK. There's been a lot of criticism of the government's plans in Russia. Why do you think that is, Lubov? Actually, I am supporting this criticism uh, because for sure these measures will not improve the birth rate of Russian women. Women will not deliver unwanted children. The epoch of conservatism, which is uh, at the moment in Russia, shows an ability of the Russian government and the Russian Ministry of Health uh, to support Russian women's reproductive choice. I mean, contraception, when, uh, when, the, family, um, when the family issues and the family financial state, state, statements uh, are not that strong, it is the only way to terminate unwanted pregnancy. But the better way is to prevent it. Lubov, what about the uh, social incentives that the Russian government is offering for women in order to promote childbirth? (laughs) These social incentives supported the delivery mostly in the marginal groups of uh, Russian population. The promotion of such uh, financial incentives uh, can, of course, uh, be um, a sort of one step forward, but only for those families who are planning next baby, those who already fulfilled the number of children they would want to have in their families, they wouldn't use these financial incentives in order to to get them or in order to get to have another child. So it is only a move towards the change of the calendar of birth. So what you're saying is that the Russian government is more interested in uh, increasing the country's population as opposed to bringing down the rate of abortion? Actually, the demographic policy shows the interest in having more uh, population. But on the other hand, very high rate of uh, mor- mortality among teenagers and government does not pay any attention to that. Uh, government does not pay any attention to the, to the system of uh, preventative medicine. Uh, all these restrictive measures which the government is proposing uh, are only pressing women. They are not stimulating for anything. They are pressing poor women, and women's activists are considering that to be very unfair to the Russian women who are in parallel uh, getting a high rate of education, building their career, and are good mothers. 
Lubov, thank you. If we turn to Dr. Charlie Walker, who's a sociologist, in relation to demographics, are there any examples of countries that have successfully limited the amount of abortions carried out and increased the population at the same time? Uh, well, the main sort of um, historic example of this would be, of course, Romania from the 1960s, where they they actually banned abortion outright in order to increase the the population. But it didn't really have a, a sort of positive long term impact. Um, essentially, you got a spike in extra births over the first couple of years, and then this died down. Um, and then you know the uh, things kind of stabilised. And of, of course, you had lots of unintended consequences, like unwanted children ending up in in orphanages. Um, and then, of course, in the Soviet Union, uh, under Stalin, there was also a policy to the, there's a ban of abortion from the 1930s through to the 1950s, again, with the aim of increasing the population and again, with very uh, without really very successful results, uh, essentially because, you know, uh, limiting access to um, to legal abortion is, is not the only way of stopping unwanted pregnancies or preventing unwanted pregnancies. Are there examples of how a country does improve its demographic situation other than by limiting abortions? Uh, yeah, there are many examples. I mean, limiting abortions is in itself a, a, a pronatalist policy, but there are lots and lots of other types of pronatalist policy, such as, um, you know, baby bonuses, this type of thing, which Russia has actually got a, a long history of. Um, the the success of these policies is quite difficult to um, to, to, to measure. In, in some cases, there are quite obvious uh, results, and in, in other cases, the results seem to be quite minor. So uh, usually there's a sort of distance between the actual number of children per woman and then the ideal number of children per woman. But really the the, the main thing, uh, other than these actual uh, specific kind of incentivizing policies, the main thing that seems to be important for increasing the um, uh, level of fertility in a country is creating those sort of wider social and economic conditions which are family, child and woman friendly, not about simply incentivizing birth. If we turn to Anne, you're from an anti-abortion charity in the UK. What do you make of the Russian legislation, the tightening of abortion law? Um, first of all, we're pro-life, not um, anti-abortion. Um, but um, I think anything which tightens abortion laws is probably a good thing. We've seen what's happened here. Um, very liberal abortion laws have resulted in one in four pregnancies being terminated. And our um, organisation deals with women both before and after termination. Um, and it's my experience, and I was actually a counsellor, but I couldn't use the word counsellor now, but many years ago, um, when I spoke to many, many women, and I would say in the majority of cases, the choice to have an abortion wasn't being made by the woman. It was a choice not being forced upon her, but something she was doing to satisfy um, somebody else, very often a boyfriend and often her parents. I mean, even now, even sometimes a well-intentioned doctor or social worker. So it seems to me that many, many women, I think there's more and more examples of this, that women, we live in a society where women have learnt that the only way to compete in the workplace is to be like men and actually I think it, as a feminist that we should be saying women have babies get over it um, and we need to be doing more and more to facilitate women um, in the workplace to ensure that they can stay in employment to ensure they can stay in education um, and I really don't think that putting pressure on women and that's what feels happening in this country particularly in the issue of um, women carrying ch children with fetal abnormalities huge amount of pressure on them to abort there's nearly a duty to abort in this country now or is a duty to abort really um, and tragically, I mean, abortion is cost effective for the government. It's much easier for the government to pay the £600 for an abortion than to help a woman um, mind a child for the next 16, 16 years of its life. It's certainly much cheaper to pay the 16 or 1900 for late abortion um, and not have to help a family raise a child with special needs all of its life. So I think a decent, civilised society actually reaches out to women and tries to help and support them rather than um, encouraging them to terminate the pregnancies. Because the next thing you know, you know we're, we're suggesting abortion is the answer to poverty. It's the answer to, you know, m you know to dis we discriminate horribly in this country about people with disabilities. The idea that a child can be aborted in the ninth month of pregnancy because it has a disability is, to me, very, very barbaric. <laughs> Kate, if we turn to you, every so often we do hear about how much abortions are costing the taxpayer. So last year, the UK taxpayers spent £180 million on abortions. Do you think the costs are justified? 
Well, I, I mean, it's quite. I mean, it's, it's interesting because it actually reflects exactly what Anne was just saying that um, that the cost to the taxpayer of having a child, uh, you know, brought into the world and raised, um, yeah, is obviously much much higher than the cost of a termination. What we're talking about here, though, in Russia specifically, um, is a, is a to me a really really horrible uh, measure. Is that they're saying we want to raise our population, and of, of course, you know, they're sort of entitled to have their opinion on that. And so what they want to do is then force women who don't want to continue with the pregnancy to do so. It's 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 sort of and it's turning around to specific groups of women as well and saying, well, we'll let you off if you're a rape victim. But if you're in prison and this, that and the other, we're just going to change the rules. I, I don't think it helps anybody um, to be turning around to women and forcing them to do something that they don't want to do. Ultimately, it's about choice. And I'm absolutely in favour of having, you know, hospitals that support women who are going through difficult pregnancies. I'm absolutely in favour of having childcare available. I'm absolutely in favour of telling young mums telling older mums, telling anybody that if they want to continue with the pregnancy that then they're absolutely welcome to do so but I think we also, you know, in order for them to be able to make that choice, they also have to have the other choice open to them and what we're seeing in Russia is a closing down of that choice and, and, and ultimately what we're likely to see is therefore an increase in unwanted uh, pregnancies and unwanted children and we know that when children are brought into this world to families where they're not really wanted um, ultimately that you know that opens up a whole new range of problems orphanages overflowing it opens up problems of children being left unattended neglected um, and ending up in crime and all this kind of stuff we've seen a direct link between that what we actually want is for every child born to be a wanted child and in order to make that feasible we have of course to make sure that unwanted pregnancies can be terminated efficiently and, and so on and so forth. Now, what came up a little bit when you were talking to uh, Lubwife was that, um, of course, there's a real problem in Russia with availability of contraception. And, of course, we can hugely decrease the number of abortions taking place in Russia um, and in lots of places around the world um, and the number of unwanted pregnancies simply by making sure that uh, women of all different social groups and women of all different ages have access to free contraception when they need it. Just to remind you, you're listening to The Voice of Russia with me, Paulina Boyko. Today, we're discussing abortion with Lyubov Yurafeyeva, Dr. Charlie Walker, Anne Scanlon and Kate Smurthwaite. If we turn back to Dr. Charlie Walker, a lot of demographers in Russia say that replacing abortion with contraception could speed up the rate of Russia's depopulation. What's the situation with contraception in Russia? There's quite a sort of particular um, situation with contraception in Russia, which is related to the way that um, particularly the medical profession, well, the state essentially uh, related to two different forms of contraception in the Soviet period. And it tended to discourage the use of, um, of contraceptions on the basis that they could be harmful to reproductive health. And it tended to encourage um, abortion on the basis that this was less harmful, which is, of course, would be the opposite um, for, you know, people in the UK would tend to approach these two uh, forms of child uh, of birth control in, in the opposite way. And so the situation now is that in, I would say, in cities like St. Petersburg and Moscow and, you know, the, the, the big... Um, uh, the big sort of cosmopolitan uh, capitals, you, you are seeing a shift towards a greater use of, of more sort of um, the, the forms of contraception that we see in Western countries. But for a lot of women, it, it's still abortion, which is seen as you know, the way out of, of an unwanted um, an unwanted pregnancy. And so, you know, whether or not we'll see, I mean, restricting abortion might see an increase, might produce an increase in the use of uh, the forms of contraception that, that people tend to use in the West. That might not be a, a, a bad thing. If we turn back to Lubov for a moment, has Russia seen a rise in, in children in orphanages, in death rates as a result of illegal abortions? Do you know about any of these statistics? Yes, of course I'm aware of the statistics. I should say that firstly, uh, the rate of abortion in Russia is decreasing year by year, annually. But the conservative groups, they do not consider that to be a success. They want more. They want more victims. They want more vulnerability among women's population. Unfortunately, the rate of uh, uh, modern contraceptive use is not that high in Russia as we experts would like to have to be. Uh, this is because uh, it is a rather costly exercise for uh, exercise for each woman, and the government does not support the reimbursement for insurance of contraceptive use. I second the psychologist who is, who is uh, talking with us uh, that for the poor woman it is much more um, easy uh, to go for, for a legal abortion which is conducted in the state 
um, clinic or institution because it is free of charge. Is it cheaper? Is it cheaper for the government to carry out all these abortions? No, no, no. For the government, it's uh, it's uh, it's the same thing, but there is no political will to support women to prevent unwanted pregnancy. It is much easier to restrict something than to think thoroughly and to propose the national strategy to decrease the rate of abortions. Uh, and the um, religious influential groups are having their revenge. And what's your take on, on this situation? Okay, well, a wife is clearly, she talks about an increase in, you know, victims and vulnerability and forcing women to have more children. Well, there's a huge difference between encouraging women and forcing women. Yeah, and I, if you're banning, sorry. If you're banning, uh, no, and I think you can, you can get to this. No, no, we're not banning. We're suggesting as Le Boeuf, as Le Boeuf, no, they didn't. They're, they're, redu- they're reducing the amount of public money spent on late term abortions. That's what they plan to do. It among poor no, people. I'm sorry. No, no, if no. no. can't afford it and no, it's I not think... being offered to them, that is, then they just don't have it. It's not about... No, but I think I'd like to take you up, Kate, on something you said. We're very clever slogans, every child wants a child. And I don't know about Romania. We all know about the Romanian orphanages and I'm sure you are much better equipped to, to talk about why those children are in those orphanages. But if you look at Britain, um, there's actually a correlation in Britain between the increase in abortions and the increase of children into ca- ta- being taken into care. If the 1967 Abortion Act was supposed to solve the problem of unwanted children, why are there increasing numbers of children in care every year. And well, it's because wanted- of the way that at the same time that the, abo- uh, the, the Abortion ca- Act came in, we also started looking at the way that children were raised in general. And in the past, we'd taken the attitude that we just leave kids with their parents regardless of how horrific the situation. And we didn't take child abuse, physical or sexual child abuse, seriously. And these days, I'm really glad to say we do. And we take children out of dangerous situations and out of unsafe situations. And I mean, if that isn't obviously a good thing, I, I sort of can't imagine what what is. Um, obviously, we don't want to leave children, we, and we used to not do anything okay, about but child that abuse, doesn't mean, and now we do. But there, that's, so that's good. Yeah, but I don't think an unwanted pregnancy necessarily leads to an unwanted child. And actually, if, if society is putting pressure on women with unplanned pregnancies to terminate, the option to love and care for their own children is taken away. But hold on a minute, I'm not talking about putting pressure on women to have a termination. I'm absolutely against putting pressure on women to have a termination. But what you're talking about is preventing women from having a termination. Well, yeah. that, that that is. I think that, that's not a question. That's not a question of putting pressure on people. That's taking their choice away. That is forcing people to continue. No. I mean, that, that's forced pregnancy. Right. I'm sorry, Leboyf. Did you want to respond? Uh, yes, I want to respond. I should say that um, the amount of uh, those late abortions due to social grounds uh, was very, very low. It is like three percent of all abortions conducted before uh, the twelve weeks. So since it is very small amount of figures we are talking, this measure shows that the government is not thinking thoroughly, that they are just uh, giving uh, the conservative wins, the conservative groups, uh, the possibility to succeed in their um, uh, ideas, natalist and anti-choice ideas. I should also say that we have a very high rate of uh, orphan or, or, orphanages um, uh, am, um, among women uh, who are which are socially deprived and uh, who are marginal, and the social grounds for those women who uh, have lost their husband or who are uh, disabled uh, or those who have restrictions in their parental rights. Uh, how how the government? is looking uh, towards um, the children who would be delivered in these social groups. They will be socially deprived. You're suggesting that women whose husbands have died and women in poor financial situations should be encouraged to have abortions. No, I she's think not that's saying encouraged. She is. No, she's she saying is. allowed. No, she's, she's saying, saying we shouldn't allowed. remove because they will be brought up in bad social conditions. She's that's saying, the problem. No, but uh, she's, she's, saying, saying, she's saying that these women should have the choice. Let us leave and, women's and, decision to themselves, exactly. not to the government. It is not the government who should decide for them. 
Could I bring in another element, which is the Russian Orthodox Church? It's supported the tightening of abortion legislation, but at the same time, they have criticized and said that the Russian government isn't doing enough. They'd like to see the government do more to encourage women not to terminate their pregnancies, much like Anne, what you're saying, and that they've voiced disappointment in the past over the Russian government's decision not to take up many of their suggestions, such as opening pregnancy crisis centers for women. Kate, what's your take on pregnancy crisis centres? Well, it, it, it largely depends on what services they actually provide. There are, of course, um, I mean, of course, I'm in favour of the provision of, you know, medical services for women. Of course, um, people who've, who've had unprotected sex should be able to get tested for different diseases. They should be able to get a pregnancy test. They should be able to find out about all the options that are open to them. Unfortunately, in this country, there are some unscrupulous organisations who claim to offer crisis pregnancy counselling and actually will do anything in their power to talk women out of having a termination. Um, so I think, you know, in this country, what I'd like to see is legislation which makes sure that, that services are labelled for what they are. And I think in places like Russia, it would be great if services are available. And again, they need to be clear about what is being offered and make sure that women are being told about everything that's available. And, and I think actually these kind of centres would be a, a, a brilliant thing to do if they could also provide young women with advice about contraception and with some of the modern contraceptives that are not so widely used in Russia. We could actually be saying to young women, here's an opportunity to take control of your lives. It's much less expensive to fund that than it is to then fund all the aftercare that comes with people who find themselves in crisis pregnancy. So I think it's a, it's a, great, uh, it's a great possibility there. Just to remind you, you're listening to The Voice of Russia with me, Paulina Boyko. Today, we're discussing abortion with Lyubov Yurafeyeva, Dr. Charlie Walker, Anne Scanlon and Kate Smurthwaite. Charlie, what, what are the biggest obstacles? Why do people choose not to have children in Russia? Well, I think you can see from um, what happened in the, in the 1990s where you got this massive decline in fertility um, that, uh, you know, it was the general sort of instability of the time. You got rising unemployment, you got high crime levels, epidemics. Uh, the country was in a sort of a, a basic kind of social and economic crisis in the 1990s. Uh, and people didn't feel that they had the stability to have... Um, at least to have a second child. People continue to have actually the first child in the 1990s uh, when the, the main sort of aspiration amongst families in, in Russia and amongst women in Russia is often to have two children. This is the sort of uh, the aspiration. But in the 1990s, families were too worried about their financial position uh, to be able to sort of take that the, the next step and expand their families. Um, we're seeing that a little bit more now because of the greater stability of, of the 2000s. But the big sticking issue uh, still is housing. Housing is a major problem. For, uh, for 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 most young families, uh, so I'm I'm doing a project at the moment on uh, the well-being of vulnerable groups in Moscow, which is looking at the uh, well-being of young families and, and the elderly. And the the main issue that young families always talk about is access to to housing. And you know you get these some large families with three, four, five children uh, who are all sort of living together in a one a one room department. Some of them staying in the kitchen, even you know the, the conditions simply aren't there to support the sort of population growth. That, uh, that the Russian government is in, in, interested uh, in creating through these sort of incentivizing policies or through the restriction of abortion. So, but housing, I would stress in particular. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Anne, any final thoughts? Hi, my encouragement to the Russian government would be to help support women so they can carry on with their pregnancies. Okay. Well, I'll maybe just uh, sort of uh, continue from something that Leboeuf was saying earlier when she was saying that uh, that only a very small number of women are really going to be affected by this. And I, on the one hand, I guess we should be encouraged by that. But I guess for me, I just I can't help thinking that for each one of those women who is affected and who's then forced to continue with a pregnancy against her will, it is kind of a very clear and personal tragedy. And so to my mind, I think that we have to look at individual women and make sure that they're all being given the best options for them. And Lyubov, uh, do, do you have anything to add to today's discussion? Yes, yes thank you for, for colleagues. Uh, I agree with most of the statements. Uh, and I should say that uh, for the Russian government, I would recommend look not only at the birth rate, considering the demographic crisis, but to the mortality rate, especially mortality rate of young male population, which is very serious, and to migration policy as well. But... The, the crisis centers, the crisis uh, pregnancy centers, they would not, of course, give uh, any kind of contraceptive advice because mostly they will pick up the ideas 
from the bias counseling uh, widely spread in the United States, and that will be a copy of United States picture, I'm sure. That will be not the real counseling for support. That will be pressure onto women to give the birth to unwanted child. That's all we've got time for today. Stay with us. My thanks today to my guests, Luboj Fierafeyeva, Charlie Walker, Anne Scanlon, and Kate Smurthwaite. Thank you very much.